In this video, we're going to look at the cell membrane structure and function. In fact, let's start with the function and then do the structure. In our last video, when we took a tour through the cell, we briefly discussed the function of the cell membrane as a gatekeeper. It's going to determine what comes in and out of a cell. Anytime something does come in or out of a cell, it's going to have to deal with this cell membrane. So it's kind of like a gatekeeper. It oversees all traffic in and out of our cell factory. The next function is compartmentalization. By creating a distinct internal and external environment, we allow for such processes such as chemiosmosis and making uh, processes such as the action potential possible. But we have to have a distinct uh, outside and inside with some barrier across which things can happen. And finally, cell-to-cell -cell communication and recognition. Um, when cells talk to each other, these signals are received by the cell membrane. Uh, hormones plug into receptors, neurotransmitters plug into receptors. During the immune system, uh, cells are recognized by their surface marker proteins uh, and carbohydrates. So the surface of the cell and the cell membrane plays very important roles in the functioning of the cell. Now let's look at the structure of the cell membrane. In fact, we're going to build one. And let's start with these guys, phospholipids. You might recall from our video on uh, biomolecules that phospholipids are interesting molecules because they consist of, a, consist of a phosphate head, which is hydrophilic, and two fatty acid tails, which are hydrophobic. So we have one end of this molecule that likes water and one end that doesn't. So here I have a bunch of phospholipids. What would happen if I added water? Well, if I put a bunch of water molecules over here, the phosphate heads are going to turn towards the water and the fatty acid tails are going to turn away. Well, that's fine, but what if I have water on both sides? Let's make some more water here. Put these over here. If I put some water on this side, well, these fatty acids, or these phospholipids, are going to turn and uh, face this way. Whoops, I mean to do that. and they're going to orient themselves uh, like this. They might self-assemble into maybe a sphere. And it's going to take me a while to get these in the right uh, alignment, but bear with me here. I'm going to pause and stop and jump ahead. You can see that as uh, we have water on both sides that these lipids are going to form a bilayer with the phosphate heads pointing out in the direction of the water and the hydrophobic fatty acid tails pointing in. And we get this bilayer, this double layer of phospholipids. Due to the chemical properties of these molecules, these phospholipids, they'll self-assemble into this bilayer. While phospholipids are the primary component of the cell membrane, they're not, they're not the only components. We also have a variety of different proteins that are embedded throughout the membrane and serve different functions. Some can act as uh, gates to allow things to travel through or, or channels to allow particles to move through the cell membrane. We can see right here. Um, others have uh, structural components and recognition components. And uh, we'll add some other proteins in as we go. In addition to the proteins, we also have carbohydrates and cholesterol. So the carbohydrates sometimes will be attached to the proteins. Uh, there can be other ones attached to uh, or in the uh, membrane here. And we'll put some of these cholesterols. Let me add a couple more. Um, the, cho whoops, the cholesterols will be in the uh, membrane here. And we'll talk about what their function is also. And there we go. And as we can see, the cell membrane is a complex structure that's made of many individual pieces. Some would call it a mosaic. Additionally, each of these pieces is independent. They're not physically connected to each other, so they can move. The proteins can move uh, through the membrane. They can slide back and forth. The, the outer layer and the inner layer can move past each other. They can slide. So this uh, mosaic is also fluid. So we can call this the fluid mosaic model of the cell membrane. It's a mosaic of phospholipids, proteins, cholesterols, and carbohydrates.
that are fluid in nature and that they can move and pass one another and we can uh, make vesicles out of this material and uh, add to it so it's a fluid it's a, it's a, a fluid system it's in flux at all times here's a more artistic rendition of that model in this drawing you get a sense of the three-dimensional nature the, the depth of the picture here uh, much better than anything I could draw of course we can talk about the functions of some of these parts here. The carbohydrates will play a role in some of the cell-to-cell -cell recognition, some of the markers and on the surface of cells. The proteins have many functions. Um, uh, they're involved in transport. We'll talk more about that later, helping things move in and out of the cell. Uh, they may be enzymes right there on the surface of the cell that help catalyze reactions. They can help in signal transduction. They can be actual physical receptors on the surface of the cells. They also can be physical markers, protein markers for cell recognition, and help form some of the cell-to-cell -cell junctions. So lots of different roles for those proteins. The cholesterols, these cholesterols that are embedded in the membrane, actually help reduce the fluidity as uh, maybe these are trying to slide past. They'll help uh, slow down that fluidity and actually uh, give the cell a little bit more structure, or the cell membrane a little bit more structure. Now let's talk about the properties of the cell membrane. We already said that it's a mosaic, that's one of the properties, and it's fluid, that's another one of the properties. However, the, probably the most important property is that the cell membrane is selectively permeable. That means that it lets some things pass through it, but not others. So let's think about this. What type of particles could move through the cell membrane? Well, one of the physical properties of something that can move through the cell membrane is that it's got to be small. I mean, physically, to get through these space, to make it through there, you can't be large. If this were, you know, whoops, make that bigger, hold on. There we go. Uh, this object is just physically too big. So one of the characteristics of a substance that can get through the cell membrane is that it must be fairly small to get through here. Now that's just one of the properties. How about this? What if this particle were a charged particle, an ion? It turns out that ions have a very difficult time making it through the cell membrane, even if they're small. They have to find other ways in, like through specific protein channels. But through the bilipid layer, ions don't have much luck. Well, what about water? It turns out that water molecules can get through here, even though they're polar, which makes a, uh, most polar molecules have a difficult time, but water is small enough that it actually can pass through the cell membrane. So if we were going to make a list of things that could get through the bilipid layer, we'd say that those things would be small, uh, non-charged, and uh, non-polar, with the exception of water. Now that doesn't mean that things that are larger or charged or polar can't get through, they just have a hard time getting through this part, through this cell uh, bilipid layer. And that brings us to transports. How do things get across the cell membrane? Well, before we get into the specific types of transport, we need to talk about two broad categories, passive transport and active transport. Passive transport is transport that goes down or with the concentration gradient. In other words, if we're going down the hill, if we roll this ball, we're not going to have to spend energy to get that ball to go down the hill. It'd be a passive. It's going from areas of higher concentration to areas of lower concentration. Now in this case I've represented it as a hill, but we need to think about the concentration of molecules when we determine whether it's passive or active transport. Active transport, conversely, is going against the concentration gradient or up the concentration gradient. To get this ball to go up the hill, we'd have to spend energy, and cells spend energy in the form called ATP. Let's look at some specific types of passive transport. And the first is diffusion. Diffusion is the movement of materials from areas of, areas, from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. It does not cost energy. It's going down the hill. Oops, down the hill. So in this picture, when we look at uh, these yellow dots, whatever they may be, whatever molecule these represent, we see that outside of this cell, there are a lot more of them than inside. So we have a higher concentration outside than in. So these yellow dots want to move uh, which direction? Into the cell or out of the cell? That's right. They want to move in, down their concentration gradient. So if we were to represent this movement of these molecules in this direction, we'd call that diffusion. 
they'd be moving down their concentration gradient and grab some of these guys they diffuse across down their concentration gradient right through the lipid layer and we call that diffusion now question what if these yellow dots represented water if we let these yellow dots represent water then this movement this diffusion of water across the selectively permeable membrane has a special name we call that osmosis osmosis is the diffusion of water across a selectively permeable membrane. It's a very specific definition and since it's uh, diffusion it's by definition passive. It's moving down the concentration gradient. Now what about these uh, down here, these positive charged ions? If these ions, if we look at it, which way do they want to move? Where is there a higher concentration? Inside or outside? Well it's very obvious to see that we have a lot more of these red positive charges inside so they would like to move down their concentration gradient which in this case would be out but we know that ions have a difficult time getting through the bilipid layer but if there's a channel provided for them by a protein then we have a path for these ions to move down their concentration gradient now they're being helped by a protein however it's still passive and we call it facilitated diffusion it's the diffusion of materials with the help of channel proteins. It's still moving down the concentration gradient, so it's still passive. What about active transport? Can we move materials against the concentration gradient? For example, can we move these molecules out, even though out is going up the hill or against the concentration gradient? And the answer is we can, but it requires active transport. Let's see how this might work we have some special gate proteins here that can physically change their shape and these molecules can be moved across the membrane with the aid of these proteins now that movement is going to require the input of energy so let's pull these guys back in here and back it up and show the input of that energy Let's follow what might happen. Molecules move in. We get an input of energy from ATP, which causes the proteins. Again, we call this active transport. It requires ATP and the help of transport proteins. Now, what happens if the molecule or the particle we're trying to move in or out of the cell is this? Meaning, on scale, it's much, much bigger. It's obvious that this is never getting through the cell membrane. It's never going to make its way through even one of these channels. It's just not going to happen. So can we get large particles in and out of the cell? And the answer is yes. So I've changed the scale here, and here's our large molecule. And the question is, can we get something of this scale through this membrane? And the answer is through endo and exocytosis, yes. The movement of large particles um, in or out of the cell uh, getting wrapped up in a vesicle into endocytosis out of exocytosis. So let's look at some pictures. First let's look at endocytosis. Let's say that some droplet falls on the surface of a cell and slowly indents further and further into the cell membrane. And it actually gets wrapped up in a piece of the cell membrane which we call a vesicle. We call this form of endocytosis penocytosis. Another form of endocytosis called phagocytosis the cell moves itself changes its shape and wraps around the cell particle or the particle maybe it's a piece of food and eventually engulfs it into a vesicle the opposite of endocytosis is exocytosis it's basically pinocytosis in reverse a vesicle moves to the side of the cell membrane joins with it fuses its vesicle with the cell membrane and expels the particle out of the cell we just have to remember scale. If we zoom in to this line, we have to understand that, that this black line represents this phospholipid bilayer that we've been zoomed in on. So that large particles can get in and out of a cell, but not through the cell membrane, yet wrapped up in a piece of the cell membrane called a vesicle.
Now that wraps up our video on the properties and structure and function of the cell membrane. I had hoped in this video to get to a discussion on tonicity and the relative constant, uh, solute concentration between solutions. I think I'll just have to do like a little three-minute video on that separately, so check back for that soon.